about three or four hours. So really cool. I think we're bringing lunch. Um, I'm hoping to make this like a pretty quick presentation. I know some of you already have probably skedaddle and you know, other things. But, uh, some of you have heard me talk before. I've been here the past couple of times, the past couple of years. Uh, I tried to change this up a little so if you've heard me before, hopefully I've got some new stuff in here, especially with some of the recent events that just happened. So, this picture to start off is actually during the flow, uh, recent flow. So we got to one of our our third highest flow record, uh, but our second highest lake level record uh, ever since the lake was constructed. So that's just a picture of the back behind the dam with the water flowing water. It looks, you know, obviously a lot more turbid here than it does going down the river channel. But that was about 22,000 cubic feet per second over the flow. But I'll get to more details on that later in the rest. I just want to tell you first off just kind of who we are, why we do what we do, uh, and then I'm going to focus on Lake Conroe. We have multiple divisions, but um, river authorities were created in the beginning basically by a conservation that was established by the state in 1917 uh, by Texas legislature. The San Jacinto River Authority itself was created in 1937. Uh, we do not have any taxing authority. So if anybody says that we tax people, we do not tax anybody. We can't receive taxes from the government. Um, the way that the River Authority generates revenue is raw water, water sales and licensing. That's how the River Authority generates any kind of revenue. Uh, we're nonprofits, so it's not really revenue, but that's how we how we operate basically. Uh, and then our main mission is developing, conserving, and protecting the resources of the San Jacinto River Basin. Uh, we have four divisions. We have our Highlands Division, which is down in Highlands, Texas, just south of Lake Houston. We have our Lake Connor Division, which is where I work. We have our Woodlands Division, which is water utilities in the Woodlands with all of your uh, uh, water and, and uh, wastewater needs. And then we have our newest division, which is the DRP Division, which is also located right here behind the dam, and that's the water plant that was just recently constructed to serve the Denver County water needs. Uh, this is just a general location of where we are. We've got our general administration building, which is also right here behind the Conner Dam. And that has all the support for the whole river authority. That has everyone from your general manager, human resources, the county, uh, all of those people, uh, Michelle's there. And, uh, and then our Conner Division and our DRP are right there on the dam as well. The Woodlands Division, we all know where the Woodlands are. And then here's our Highlands Division down here, here's Lake Houston. Uh, so just while I have this up, whenever we flow water, um, obviously it goes from Lake Conner to Lake Houston. So we're on what we call the West Fork of the San Jacinto River, and there's another river over here called the East Fork. So there's two different rivers and there's several creeks contributing all throughout. But the Conner, just some quick facts, about a 450 square mile watershed. Uh, the lake itself is approximately 21,000 acres and we have somewhat of 160 miles of shoreline. It's about 2.2 miles long in the dam itself. Uh, we currently have about 4,000 permitted docks and that's residential homes that have waterfront property that want to build a dock or a cut-in slip on their property. That's where that 4,000 number comes from. OSSFs, they're basically septic systems on properties. You have some systems, uh, some houses are going to be tied into a centralized system you know, with mud, and then you have everyone else who can't tie into a centralized system who has to have their own way of getting rid of their wastewater. So they have what we call an OSSF, basically a septic system. That's an on-site sewage facility. Uh, and then across the reservoir, we have about seven major marinas. We've got bent water, Walden, Stow away up here at the top. Uh, so there's several of those. Uh, so I can send this to you all. I didn't print it out, but uh, I just want to touch base on some of these. Basically, the lake was finished uh, in January 1973. Does anybody know how long it took to fill up without looking at that? It took 10 months. So it went from ground zero, and 10 months the lake was full. So 2011, when everybody was begging for water, you know, it was uh, it was just a matter of 10 months for the whole lake to fill up. Uh, and so now we're obviously at the total now opposite of that situation. Uh, so in October 1973, it filled up. We had a lot of rain events that year, and they just filled the lake up. I mean, it's pretty quick. Uh, we are a water supply reservoir, not a flood control. Uh, a lot of people will get us confused with that just because of we are basically the only one within the San Jacinto River Basin that have any control over the flow. Everything else is free flowing creeks. Uh, but we are a water supply reservoir. We were created back in 73 in conjunction with the city of Houston as a water supply source for Houston. Now, over time, the memory has obviously developed, which is where everyone in this room is coming to play. Uh, there's a lot of developments all over the place, housing you know, boom in this area. 
And so now Montgomery County needs the water. And so uh, all the water that was basically tailored toward the city of Houston and now we're trying to gather up as much as we can to supply Montgomery County. Uh, and then you our, that? I'm sorry, how do you gather that? How do you fight that? There's a lot. I could, I could have a whole other presentation on that, but uh, <coughs> it's really hard to fight city of Houston. We're not really fighting them. It's just yeah. uh, agreements, leases, purchases. I mean, yeah, it's, water rights is a whole new thing on its own. That's where it comes into play. We have one third water rights in Lake Congress. The city of Houston has two thirds. And so we can still use that two thirds. We just got paying for it. And so that's where all of your raw water fees come into play. That's where, that's where everybody, everybody's water bill that comes in to their house that says the same amount of river water fees. Those, those are all incorporated into how we get the water. So a lot of people turn on their faucet and just take it for granted. But there's a lot behind the scenes that a lot of people don't know about that took it took a, took a lot to get to that point. Uh, a lot of negotiation, a lot of sitting <coughs> I mean, it's, it's constantly happening. It's, everybody wants water, including the city of Houston. They're growing too. And so you just, you got to think about 50 years. It's usually a water planning idea. You think about 50 years ahead. Where do you think we're going to be in 50 years? And right now we're in that stage. We're, uh, we're planning for the next 50 years for Montgomery County. And uh, I mean, it's, the numbers are huge. And so you got to find a way to get that water supply to the people that are coming. To this <coughs> so it's, that's a huge challenge for us. Uh, but our highest lake level, we hit 204.5 in this recent event, which I said was the second highest. We actually went to 205.58 back in 94. Let me go all around here. Uh, then I think it was Allison. No, and, uh, but there's a larger rainy event, yeah. and uh, obviously it will lake to two hundred five point five eight. We can actually, the lake can actually go to two hundred seven. So if you have a house out there that you're selling and their foundation is below two hundred seven, they need to know. We can hold water back to 207 legally. No, most houses, the newer houses aren't, but there are some older houses that are probably like 205, 206. Now, I think in this, this event, some of the houses got flooded. Obviously, pools are going to get inundated. You know, most of them are about 204, 205. Um, but this is just something people need to know. We have what we think it's basically a flow adjustment that we purchased from the state to be able to hold water back to 207. So that's, that's a fact that a lot of people don't know that figure out after the fact, and that's never good for them. Um, our lowest we did in 2011, which we all recently remember, uh, that was 192.68. Uh, but we also had to send water to Houston during that time, so that's part of the water we had to send to Houston. If we didn't have to send water to Houston, we probably would have only been, we probably would have been about two or three feet higher than that number. But since they own two thirds of the water rights, we had to send it to them. Uh, this is just some few pictures of our structure. We've got our main gate structure. We have a smaller inlet structure. This is tells you where we're located. Here's the new GRP plant that's right behind the dam. This is their new intake structure. If you've been out on the water recently, you can see that out there. It's, it's pretty big. Uh, and then you've got uh, what we call our service out the So when we, when we send water to Houston, which has only been about three times in history, uh, it's through this system right here. It's called the service out system. It's not, it doesn't look like that. We're not sending very much water at all to it. Uh, it's, it's a very controlled flow. It's, it's usually not around water at all. Uh, but this is an overview of what the plant looks like now, too. Here's White Oak Ranch, if you're familiar with that. That's on the east side of the dam. Uh, and that's where the plant is located. Uh, this is what the dam looked like before it filled. Sometimes I'll tell you this is what it looked like, but we don't have rain for the next 20 days. <laughs> but uh, that's the intake structure I told you about, the smaller surface outlet. Uh, this is about, at that point on the lake, it's about 60 feet at the end of that structure. So this gives you an idea of how deep it is right there. Mm -hmm. uh, some old pictures of gate construction. They did, they built the gates on site. So that's, that's pretty cool. Uh, they started, they started playing for Lake Connor back in the 40s and 50s. So they didn't get completed until 73. So that's why you know we have to plan so far ahead. You know, so if we're, Let's just say we we're building Lake Connor today. You know, we started today. You probably wouldn't see another reservoir for 30 years, 20, 30 years maybe. Mm -hmm. It's just a lot alive. of big process. <laughs> 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 
Administrative team and Megan leads that. Uh, if y'all had to call the office a lot, you probably talked to Megan before. Uh, just a quick overview of what operations does. Obviously, operations of the dam, all the gate releases. Um, it's not just a one-man thing. You've got, I mean, when we're doing small little releases, it's, it's not a whole lot. But when we get into an event like we were just in, I mean, I'm, you're talking general managers involved. Uh, we've got. Law enforcement involved, emergency personnel involved. Uh, I mean, everyone is involved when we're making all these decisions. So it's not just, oh, let's just open the gates as much as we can, let the water out as fast as we can. There's a lot of coordination with a lot of different people uh, down the line before we make any decisions. Um, we have to obviously monitor the weather at all times. Right now, we're still flowing from the event. Uh, we've reduced all the way down to about a thousand CFS right now. Um, but from that event, we had back over Memorial Weekend that. We're, we're still seeing effects of that. These little showers that keep popping up, they just hold the lake the way they are. And it just takes that long to get rid of it. Uh, we have licensing programs. We uh, obviously sell water, like I said earlier. We've got irrigation customers, residential people that are uh, properties that are across the lake. We allow people to use Lake Connor water to water their lawn or their landscape, things like that, but they have to get a permit from us. And that, that one's pretty hard to track down people that have been doing it for 20, 30 years and never told us. Now all of a sudden we tell them, oh, we found out you have a system and we need to pay for that. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's really hard to track everybody down, but if you, if you have a client that has irrigation, any, basically anything on the water, whether it's a dock, whether it's irrigation, a bulkhead, uh, dredging, anything like that, those are all licensing uh, procedures that we have for them to go through in order to get approved for that kind of stuff. Um, we have new rules and regs. I don't know if I came here last year and we had done this or not, but June of 2015, so a year ago, we just approved our latest rules and regs, and we have copies of those up here. If you want some more, we have more at the office. Uh, that's my way of getting all up there at the office. If you've never been there before, but we've brought still have new maps? copies. Yeah. We have maps. Um, they're not cheap, but we do like to give them out to, to y'all for sure because y'all see everybody that are on the lake. And so if you want to get some, you can come to the office. I didn't bring any today. Oh. Uh, Usually we could go pick up, we had to bring two business cards or something and we could get it. 25. Yeah. 25. Well, we just, we just kind of keep track of where they're going. So we're not giving to, you know, someone okay. three or four hundred dollars. You can go to the office and grab. We might give out about 25 at a time. Okay. That's easy. But we do have some. We probably need to order more. Uh, oh, there's there's new rules in there. So that's, like I said earlier, we have bulkhead licensing now, dredging licensing. Uh, so there's new licensing programs in there. And basically, what we did was mainly restructure, so it's easier to read. Before, if you've ever saw our old rules, it's just a huge paragraph. And myself, I don't, I'm not going to read. I'm going to stop after like the first two or three sentences. So we tried to structure it in a way that, you know, if you just want to see boating rules, go to page blah, and that's all you want to look at. If you just want to see permitting procedures, go to that page. So we structured it in a way that helps identify what exactly you're going to look for, and uh, hopefully it can assist you better. <clears throat> and then of course we all work together. So there's not very many of us. There's about 13 to 14 of us in the Lake Conroe Division. I think there's, in the River Authority as a whole, if you include all the division, there's about 140 of us. 57. 150. So. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're one of the small groups. But, uh, and then we also go out on the lake and we manage the aquatic plants on the lake. Uh, anything from planting native vegetation to spraying the invasive stuff. So you might see us out there on airboats uh, spraying mainly what we call giant salvinia and water hyacinth yard mm -hmm. where those plants. Um, hydrilla was a big one back in the 80s and recently back in 07 08. But hydrilla literally is almost extinct on the lake. We have 0.1 acres on the reservoir, and it's only in our isolated cages that the grass carp can't get to. Because we're trying to grow native plants in these cages, but what tends to grow in there is the hydrilla. And so we know exactly where it is. And we know, we know it's um, if you're familiar with the Woodlands, we actually manage what we call the Bear Branch Reservoir, which is off Kirkendall. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I said that right, and everybody says it differently. Mm -hmm. um, there's a reservoir there, it's a small reservoir, 60 acre reservoir, 
and uh, there's a dam there, a little flood control dam. If you want to know the difference between a flood control dam and a, and a water supply reservoir, go look at their dam and then compare it to ours. It's, there's no gate system, the water just overflows. The dam's are designed just to slow the water down, that's all it does. Um, but we do manage that in the system while the flow is to go down to Lake Woodlands. Um, we met the residential boat docks. We have boat docks and boat slips. You know, you can have a cut-in slip on someone's property. You could have a boat dock that goes out over the water, past the bulkhead. Um, I got some pictures here to show you the differences of what, what we would require in permitting. In case you all come across this and a customer asks you, you know, do I have to pay for that or somebody? Or what is that? Um, but we have commercial marinas obviously out on the reservoir. We have businesses that have to be licensed with us too. So contractors out there on the reservoir that are building these docks, they have to be licensed with us. And the main reason we want to get everybody licensed with us is just so we don't have Joe off the street coming in here with no insurance and doing a job that ends up falling apart on someone and hurting someone or injuring someone. So we make sure they have insurance, they have to pay you know, license fee for their barge, they have to pay license fee. So we, we try to get everybody licensed. If you want to do any kind of work on the reservoir, you have to be licensed with the reservoir. Um, there's a few land sales, and uh, one big thing I wanted to emphasize on this is if you're looking at a property and you look at a survey, sometimes the survey will show you the bulkhead and sometimes it won't. And there's about a 50-50 chance, maybe 40% chance, that there is a piece of land, possibly, in between that property and the lake. And we have found thousands of these across the reservoir. A lot of people don't know about them until after they bought the property and then they want to build a pool or they want to do something and then they have to show the survey to the bank to get a loan. And the bank says, wait a second, you don't own that portion of the land. We can't give you a loan on a piece of land you don't own. And then, you know, it's, it could be a five foot section, it could be a 20 foot, you know, however big of an area. But I'm talking, you know, like from me to the wall there, of a section of land, and that's where the bulkhead is with the property lines back here. And a lot of those were created back in the day whenever Lake Connor was being constructed. They went out and surveyed the elevation of 201, which is where the normal pool is for Lake Connor, and then the river authority actually bought all that land. So we actually have deep the land underneath it. Uh, so when the developers, the smart guys, found out that we were building a lake, they came in and started developing properties. So that's where Walden and Bentwater and all those guys started redeveloping their shorelines, they came in here and built bulkheads. Well, technology wasn't as, as good back then, so a lot of the uh, bulkheads crossed property lines. They came out into the water a little too far. So now we've got all these slivers of land that we don't necessarily know about either until they come to our attention. And we would like to get rid of them, but really to us it's not a, as big of a deal. But if someone wants to find out what they can do with that, have them call us. We'll sell it to them. We don't want it. And uh, it's it's probably a pretty cheap piece of land for them. Yes, ma'am. Um, is there any cases where that strip of land is also coincided with like a utility easement? And so, I mean, there's all kinds of situations. There could be an existing perpetual easement because the Lake uh, San Jacinto Urban Authority used to issue perpetual easements to like a subdivision as a whole. Mm -hmm. So there could be a perpetual easement for let's say section six, where well, there's you know, 40 lots in section six, but all of them have a perpetual easement for the piece of land in between their property and the lake which basically allows them to kind of do what they want in a way anyways, but uh, to an extent. You, know, you, can't, you can't necessarily build a house on it, but you can build your fences on it, you can build a pool on it, you can do stuff like that, tennis court if you want. Uh, but then there's sections of land that don't have anything, and there's sections of land that are adjacent to other reasons. I mean, there's all kinds of different situations. That's why the best, if you have that situation, just have to contact us and we can help you figure it out. That answer your question? Yeah. Sort of. Sort of. <laughs> I had a deal with that mm -hmm. blew up in my face because of that. And it was over and over. Yeah, that's well, that's what I don't want yeah. to happen to y'all. Because yeah. they, they had to have a tool. And I mean that was just the There's ways around it. Uh, we would like to sell it to them, but there are other ways that we can handle it if, if needed. So just have just have if you come across that situation, you can just have the property owner contact us. That's what they want. That's all they want is to build a pool. Can I ask another question? Sure. I think one of the um, biggest hurdles that I've had to deal with as far as the water level and what happens to the water and who owns the water is when a buyer starts to do it. I mean, when they're getting ready to invest over a million dollars in a piece of property and they start doing research as to well, what's going to happen with the water, they just, in, in what they see, 
on the internet is telling them, well, my doctor's not going to be any water in the lake. Why should I test this kind of What, I mean, what would you suggest they, we, so we, that's, our, that's where I would tell them, this is a water supplier. It's not guaranteed lake level. You know, we don't have, we don't have springs like they do over in uh, LCRA with those other, mm -hmm. uh, what's the one in Marble Falls? One that's a, basically, that's a constant uh, level. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. That's basically a constant, what we call a mm -hmm. constant level. Like, that mm -hmm. one's always full. And it's because of all the springs that feed it. It keeps it constantly full. It's always over. But we're, we don't have that luxury. Uh, we're very dependent on rain. So I mean, if we're in a drought situation, it's going to go down. And that's it's normal. In a summer, it's normal. No, we're not in a normal summer right now. But, uh, in a normal summer, we could lose two feet, two three feet on average. That's what we lose anyways on average a year, two to three feet. And so it could easily fluctuate two to three feet, no problem. But if we get a drought, you know, we could be back in that situation where we're back down to the 190s. Uh, I hope you never have to experience it, but on the other hand, it feels like... But on the other hand, exactly, we'd get rain event like we just did, we'd blow off. Yeah, so it's, it's, it fluctuates so much, uh, the drought cycle, that it's just not I know it's hard to buy a million dollar property on a lakefront that you don't know if water's going to be there or not in the next right. six months. And so that's just something they need to understand. Is mm -hmm. Don't sell your property on a lakefront. I had a client that was very, very concerned about the pipes. All that water is going to go farther and that's going to be a lot of problems. And they were on some amount they can sit down. So right now. Yeah, so that one goes to the Woodlands. Um, and then we have, so we have two main customers out of this water plant. And I'm not extremely savvy with our plant, so I don't work for the GRP division, but I can tell you the general basis of it. We've got a pipeline that goes to the Woodlands, and we've got a pipeline that goes to Conroe, just to keep it simple. And uh, those are the two main customers, and uh, the water that's being sent to them is approximately, it was supposed to be approximately 24 to 30 million, which is way less because we've got so much range. There's no need to send as much water to them. Uh, so the more rain we have, the less water is going to the lake, so this kind of benefits everybody. But uh, we're, so let's just say we sent the 24 to 30 million gallons a day. Uh, that basically equivalates to uh, an inch a month on the lake, so a foot a year. Now, we're obviously not sending that much water, so we're not noticing anything right now because of all the rain we've had. So if we have a normal rainfall year, which is normal for us in this area is about four feet of rainfall, 48 inches of rainfall, you'll never notice anything. Now, obviously in the winter drought situation, it's water going out, nothing coming in, it's going to go down. But there are restrictions. Uh, there are restrictions based on lake levels. So when we, when we hit a certain lake level, we have drought contingency plans. And they have a, they have to produce by a certain amount. I mean, obviously, people need water, so that's a water supply plant. That's what it's designed for. But uh, you still have to produce. So, like, first thing is going to go away is your irrigation. You know, that's that's a big water heater. So, as soon as we hit a certain lake level, then that triggers the water plant, the GRP, to notify their customers that hey, we're at a certain lake level over here. You need to reduce by, you know, whatever the percentage is based on the lake level, and then it just keeps. And the percentages keep going up as the lake level keeps going down. So there, there is a point where we have to start reducing. Does that, that answer? Okay, I'm gonna try to speed. I'm gonna try to speed it up. So if you wanna hold your questions till the end, or at least till I get to the other slides, if I have more questions, uh, please, please do it so I can get you all out of here. Uh, these are just some examples of what we would permit a dock. So this is a dock straight off the bulkhead. This is a very simple, uh, very common dock which you can see out there. Sometimes they're just one slip, sometimes they're two slips, but that's just something you would see out there. That's how we would measure it. It's just a square foot of the dock. So it's including the area where the boat would be parked. So it's not just the decking, but it's including the area where the boat would be parked. Uh, this would be an example of a combination of what we call a cut-in slip into the property owner's property as well as an extension out over the, over the what we call the bulkhead, the normal bulkhead line. Uh, this area, even though it's cut into their property, they're now inundating the property with Lake Conroe water. Therefore, our management, our rules, our contour line, the 201, everything follows that water. So what you've done is, is basically allowed what we call water to the U.S. to come onto your property. So uh, the way we handle that is it's a minimum fee. But because we have to manage all that area, and because it's part of it, we, we 
we still have to charge a fee for it, but we don't charge you what we normally do. It's just a minimum fee. Because you're privatizing an area like this. Basically what you're doing. Um, and then this is just a straight button. It's so like this would be $60 a year. That's all it would be. So we have to, we have to enforce our rules and regs in another one of our meetings. Uh, don't pay attention to where this is. I'm just going to use this as an example. But for here, you have, we, what we try to do is keep a navigational channel. And our navigational channel, our number in our minds is about 30 feet. So in this situation, uh, you've got 30 feet until you get to that point. Well, this particular dock um, wasn't really built the way it was supposed to be built. So we actually made them come and cut some of it off. So we can do that. So they just need to be very aware that they follow the procedures properly because there's a chance that we can come back and not get notified that it wasn't built the way it was, come verify it. <coughs> okay, now you didn't build it the way you're supposed to, you got to cut some off. So they had to do it. Uh, just part of it. But they also, the constables you see on the lake, they enforce not only the state laws, but they enforce our, our rules as well. Any one of our rules is a class C misdemeanor. It can be issued a citation, um, and they do that for us. We do go out and verify it, so even if someone doesn't call us, you know, we'll verify docs every so often just to make sure stuff is still the way it was supposed to be. You didn't come out there and add something on yourself just because you wanted to one summer and your kids were in town. So uh, we verify stuff. It's obviously, when people call us, but uh, we try to put doc tags on everything. And if one of your clients is I don't have a doc tag unless you know, I'm not licensed. That doesn't mean you're not licensed, it just fell off or, or we didn't, maybe we never got one on there. Uh, that's really just a license plate that we use just to help us identify the doc. So it's not really a whole lot to the customer. Uh, it's normal stuff, gate operations. We obviously have to keep control of the site. Uh, we are a high risk dam, so we, it's very secure. You know, you can't just drive up on the dam whenever you want. You have to go through all the gates and all the procedures. Uh, you actually can't drive up on the dam at all. <laughs> but if you ever wanted to see it, you can stop by and I can, we can try to coordinate something and I can show it to you. Uh, we do monitor groundwater though within the dam because the way dams are designed, you have to allow water to still infiltrate through the dam. I mean, it's, it's other nature. Water can move the way it wants to move, so you have to allow it to do that. And so throughout the dam, there's actually a drainage system and it allows groundwater to come into the dam and get redirected into all of the different basins that are underneath the ground that you can't see. <coughs> and we monitor them by these little, they're basically wells, and we have about four of them all across the dam and below the dam that we just monitor groundwater with. And then obviously public awareness, we're doing today. Uh, so we have about 14-ish, 15 weather stations, and USGS has a couple as well on this map. But when we're monitoring weather, when I say that, we have obviously our radar that we pay attention to. But during an event, we have rain gauges in our watershed. And our watershed is the yellow line. So basically anything that rains inside the yellow line comes to Lake Conroe. Anything outside of the yellow line does not come to Lake Conroe. This is Lake Creek right here on this side of Lake Conroe. That watershed is almost pretty much as big as Lake Conroe's watershed. Uh, and then all the other, all these other, everything outside this yellow line that flows down to Lake Houston is not coming through Lake Conroe. But we have our weather stations, they're basically fancy rain gauges, and we pay attention to rainfall intensity, <coughs> rainfall, how fast it's raining. And all those all that information we use to calculate and flows and calculate, you know, how we're gonna basically proceed on, on our releases. Um, this is an ex a picture of all the other watersheds. So you've got the dark green area, which is Lake Connor. Huntsville is basically the top of our watershed. Think about that. Um, the Grimes County lines on this side, and then I-45 are our boundaries. So Lake Creek is here. Then you have Spring Creek, Cypress Creek, all these other creeks that flow into Lake Houston, pretty much. Um, so we have about 450 square mile watershed. Lake Houston has about 2,000 square mile watershed. Uh, they get a lot more water than us. Um, and this is actually the event that we just had. So this will show you peak flows. This is a map we like to use to show people where the water comes from. Because everyone points the finger at the river for it. Yes, we were releasing water, but we were definitely contributing. But uh, since we're the only ones with a controllable dam, and everybody just says, you're, you're at fault. You did it. You're, you're the reason why I flooded. Um, so we like to use this map just to show you, okay, we're not the only ones contributing water to the West Fork of the San Jacinto. Recently, uh, during the Memorial event and other events 
previous to this one, we get a lot of calls from Spring Creek. And uh, Spring Creek basically follows along the Montgomery and Harris County line. And right here, down here, literally right at Humble in 59, you know, that area gets flooded a lot, as everyone I'm sure is aware. But they are literally getting all of the water, not just from us. They're getting Lake Creek's water, they're getting all these creeks that we don't even have gauges on. You got Stewart Creek, Alligator Creek, Lake Creek, all these creeks coming from Conroe. Those produce a lot of water that, uh, again, we don't have any, well, they're not our gauges. USGS doesn't have any gauges on. All our gauges are up here on the lake. Uh, these are all USGS gauges. These aren't our gauges um, that show all these flows. But Spring Creek produces a lot, a lot of water. As you can see, at our highest point, we were releasing about 22,000 cubic feet per second. Our inflows were about 90,000. We were getting a lot of water coming in that lake. That's why the lake rose so much. But we were only releasing 22. And so we're, we're trying, you can see that we're not just opening the gates and letting everything go. Because if we did, I mean, you can only imagine the devastation downstream if we did that. Um, but that was our estimated inflows. We were releasing about 22,000. Lake Creek on its own is producing 38,000. At I-45, the peak was almost 60,000. Uh, that's a combination not just of our flow in Lake Creek, but all these other creeks that feed into it right before there. We've got Spring Creek that was producing at this point about 57, so there's no telling what it was about that point. Uh, Cypress Creek was about 98. They, they're, that looks like a low number compared to all the others, but Cypress Creek floods pretty easily, so that's a high number for them. Uh, and then the West Fork, where Porter is, which is before where Spring Creek comes in, it's going about 53. So Humble's right here, and there's no gauge there. There's a gauge there, but there's no gauge on this map because they don't have a flow measurement there because there's so much water that comes in there, and, and there's just a backwater effect. So there's no way to really measure the flow. They just have a gauge height. So if you've ever looked at the uh, National Weather Forecast River, uh, National, National Weather Service, their forecast center, um, they have gauges, uh, they have maps, hydrograph maps that show you, you know, uh, estimated peak levels of rivers. They show you where they think it's going to be in four or five days. You know, they, they show you all those forecasts, and uh, we, I meant to put another slide in here to show you how to get to those, but you can go to our website, and you can go to, uh, we have a box. If you've never been to our website, if you go to sjra.net, there's a box that has current conditions, all the lake level conditions. At the very bottom, there's a uh, it's called river conditions. <coughs> lake and river conditions. Yeah, lake and river conditions, little tab. If you were to click on that, it takes you to another page on our website. And it has the River Forecast Center website. It has all these different gauges on there uh, that will take you just directly to them. And then, and then it's just kind of funneling through the internet, you know, trying to figure out how to get timestamps and what kind of information you want and stuff like that. But uh, whenever people call us, we try to, first of all, we ask, well, where are you going? And, uh, They'll tell us, and we'll look it up, and then we'll we'll try. Some of them will tr we'll try to explain. You know, you you live here. There's no way, physically way, that our water would be would be coming back on you. So, some of them they don't want to hear it, uh, and then some of them, you know, most of them are pretty understanding. But their first off the bat is, "You're flooding me." Okay, where do you live? And they'll tell us, well, "I live in the woodlands over here." You know, and we'll say, "There's." There's no possible way that we would be flooding. There's no physical way. The water is not going to be going that direction. Uh, so there's just a lot of a lot of education, I guess you could say, as to where you live and where the water comes from. So that's what we use this map for. It's a, it's a pretty good map that a lot of people have uh, have used during this event, from state officials uh, all the way up to the governor's office, uh, all the way up to the governor's office. So there's been a lot of people involved during this event. This it was a historical event. There was a lot of water at one time. That was the biggest thing. If you compare actual rainfall amounts to other events, like back in 94 or 98, that was more rainfall then. However, this event, I think we had maybe six to nine inches, but it was six to nine inches quick. Mm -hmm. And so when it comes so quick, and we've already had all these other events at the ground, you know, it all depends on conditions. The ground is saturated, everything was charged up. So any kind of rainfall that came, it was just going to get thrown into the creeks, thrown in the rivers, right into Lake Conroe immediately. So that's what happened during this event. We were already wet and charged from all these other events we had. And as soon as that rain hit, and as quick as it hit, it just filled everything up quickly. And that's that's why this event was so historical. I know I probably have a lot of questions about this. <laughs> so the Army Corps of Engineers, we're not an Army Corps of Engineers lake. Uh, there are Corps of Engineers lakes out there, but uh, 
the only regulation we would fall under with them would be if someone were dredging and they needed to uh, get an environmental permit to be able to dredge a certain area, you know, that, that kind of stuff. Keep going. Speed it up. Speed it up. just a picture. This is a 98. I don't have a picture of 94. Uh, this is a 98. This one was uh, 20, a little more than ours. It was about 23, 24 percent water, but the uh, least in the 23, 24,000, we were about 22,000. So we were only the third highest actual flow rate, which was this one. Uh, they're pretty similar. And this is Rita. This actually wasn't a high lake level, but it was just high winds, damage to the lake, uh, damage to the dam uh, on both of these. I'm going to skip through some of this stuff. OSSFs, just remember you've got centralized systems and you have areas if you're selling a property where all these dots are that have, that have an OSSF. And we actually have a uh, jurisdiction up to 2,075 feet for sept basically septic systems. So they need to get permit rights. Uh, this, are, this just shows you how many are around the county. All those black dots, they're everywhere. Uh, and then maintenance, obviously, we, we maintain everything and keep up with it. Uh, these are some pictures, so I'll go through some of these quick. We got a motor <coughs> float, we got to repair things. We got to do inspection that's behind one of the gates when we're not going. It's pretty fun. Uh, we do have airboats, and we do try to reestablish uh, native vegetation as a fish habitat. We do what we call spider blocks. If you were to go on Text Parks and Wildlife's website, you can find the location of these if you're a fisherman. And uh, there's basically off Diamond Head Point, Walden, Road, uh, Walden Point, and then right off the, the dam, we have about three or four locations of these. Ired Island, we actually mow Ired Island. If you ever wonder who mows them, that's us. We have <laughs> homemade bars that we take a, a zero turn mower out on in a couple of years, and we go out and mow this thing. Uh, we've got some new signs that are going to go out there. If you ever go out there, just to replace the old ones that are in there. Uh, when we were flowing to Lake Houston, that's what it looked like. It's really not a lot of water, but <coughs> that's what it, how much water we're taking out. And it was about, uh, I think, 200 CFS, something like that. Uh, during the hurricanes, we used the same damage. The rocks on the back, on the upstream of the dam were there for a purpose to protect the dam. So when we get a hurricane that comes in, we've got high winds, high waves, and water can do a lot of damage. They pulled all these rocks basically off the dam, so they had to come back and pull them back up and re regrade everything. Uh, that was, I think that was uh, Ike, maybe, that did this. See how close? I mean, he did his job, but that's what it's there for. That was a pretty expensive fix. I think that was a couple of names. So, some of the stuff we need help from y'all when you're dealing with customers is uh, basically they don't know who we are. Please help them figure out who we are. Have them contact us. I mean, whatever it takes, go to our website. But um, if they're new to the area, they may not know who the river board is, but if they're buying a waterfront property and they've got a dock or a bulkhead head out there, they're going to have to figure out who we are eventually. So uh, the more information you can give them, the better. Uh, we do have a permitting process to post those bulk bulkheads. You can go on our website with our rules or you can take one with you. Uh, or you can just have them call us. That's always the easiest thing. Just have them call us. Uh, there are sometimes fees associated with the property. They have a, they have a dock for a boat slip. They need to know that they're going to have a, a fee come from us. And if they were never told about it, and all of a sudden they get this invoice in the mail and say, hey, you owe us $100 for a dock. Uh, they're going to say, what is this? And so then they get to call us and figure out what it is. Uh, like we said earlier, property ownership, make sure they're exactly aware of what they're getting. Because sometimes there are situations like we talked about earlier where it could be a piece of land in between their property and the whole bit. And then, of course, lake level fluctuations we talked about. Uh, this is a water spot reservoir, and we're not a constant level lake. It's going to be up and down in the summer. Um, and now, obviously, during rain events like we're in right now, like I said, we can go up to 207 if, if we have had to, which I hope we never see. But we, we've already been to 205 and a half, so it definitely happened. Um, and then it goes down in the summertime. Just make sure they know that. Uh, if y'all deal with title companies, some information we <laughs> would like to have, and it would help us out, uh, is this right here. You know, who to send the request back to as far as the title company, what company and contact number it is, uh, the name of whoever the current homeowner is, address of the property closed, because sometimes they're not necessarily the same as what's on our record, uh, lot block section number. That just helps us identify the property, helps us get, to, get in touch with the title company, it just helps clean things up for your customer, makes it easier for them, they don't get any headaches. They're not going to come back on you and say you didn't tell them what they needed to know. Uh, 
and all that stuff. You can send that. You can call and talk to Rhonda, or you can email it to her right there. Or, uh, you can call me. We'll help you out. We've got some bald eagles around the reservoir. If you've ever seen me flying around. Uh, and then, of course, we've got the two uh, That's actually, uh, somebody know that is? Yeah. I haven't seen him in a while. We've got a whole family. You ever heard of Keith Coates? Yeah. Yeah. That's not a good one. Yeah. 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 Yeah.